Hi, I'm Matt, and welcome to my latest tech news video. I'll be covering recent tech news in this video. These news videos will generally cover gaming related tech, but also tech and hardware in general. I'm grateful for any feedback, so if you feel the need to do so, please leave a comment below. You can also like and subscribe if you're enjoying my videos. I'm now getting some tech news from the past week or so. We will start today's video uh, off with two bits of AMD GPU related news. It seems there's so much of, of this recently AMD related stuff, I guess because AMD is preparing new cards uh, to launch soon. So speculation is sort of a bound, I guess. <laughs> but um, yeah, quick note on this first uh, topic. I was about to record this video or when I was about to record it. Uh, Moore's Law is Dead, who is a tech YouTuber I quite often watch, actually uploaded a related video going over the rumors I'll be covering. I won't get too much into it here, as I'd prefer if you watched his video on the topic. I will link it in the description where I usually put sources and references, so please go watch it if you're interested. Tom and his team do great work over on his channel, Moore's Law is Dead. But yeah, I will continue giving my thoughts on these rumours, but just thought I'd add that in, in case uh, you wanted a bit more information. But yeah, there's that bit of a note done. I'll um, do the, yeah, the first bit of AMD GP news, news is, uh, yeah, RDNA 4 news. So that's the planned successor, as you might expect, to RDNA 3. Um, and yeah, apparently it may not have any high-end or enthusiast class GPUs in its lineup. And RDNA 4 will be the architecture behind AMD's upcoming Radeon 8000 GPUs. The GPUs which have apparently been cancelled, according to the recent rumours, are the Navi 41 and 42 GPUs, which would be at the core of the uh, 8000 or 800 and 900 class Radeons. So, for example, the RX 8800 XT and 8900 XT and XTX, if they were to release those. But yeah, it looks like that high end might have been decided against for RDNA 4. But um, yeah, as I mentioned, that Moore's Law is dead video. Yeah, he spoke about it a bit more. So yeah, definitely watch um, his video if you want more uh, more in-depth details on why they might be doing it and things. Yeah, it was a pretty good watch. But um, yeah, if these rumors are true, then AMD will only be competing at the low to upper mid-range with potential graphics cards like for example the RX 8700 XT and RX 8600 and lower end RX 8000 graphics cards. This would mean AMD will be more focused on these segments of the market with its next gen GPUs unlike the previous and current gen where AMD has aimed to provide graphics cards in most if not all performance ranges really including the enthusiast level. I would say I'd be surprised if AMD uh, decided against releasing high-end and enthusiast class GPUs, but actually, after watching um, Moore's Law is Dead's video on the uh, on this on this um, the sort of these RDNA four rumors, I'm yeah a bit less surprised, I guess. He had some interesting things to reveal and speak on, but yeah, I sort of think if this does happen, which is looking more likely, I guess um, this yeah would allow nvidia to sort of take their gaming and productivity crown again uh with its like flagship and enthusiast uh cards without too much competition i guess like for example with the potential rtx 5090 and 5080 gpus um as i'm guessing an rx 8700 xt class card wouldn't compete with those 90 and 80 class cards from nvidia but i've also heard rumblings that nvidia may also not be um be focusing entirely on its highest end cards but um yeah that might be something to talk about later on if any more comes out about that so maybe nvidia and amd might be sort of focusing on the mid or uh, upper mid range cards in the future or at least for their next generation but after that who knows <laughs> but yeah if this is the case with amd sort of pulling out of the uh the enthusiast like the high end this could lead to a lack of competition at the higher market segments and which i don't think is a good thing i think competition is pretty vital throughout the gpu market segments or else consumers could be squeezed even more at the uh at the high end but yeah as always these are these are still rumors um amd could change things around we don't know but this is just the recent uh sort of leaks and things but yeah let's hope amd does end up releasing higher tier graphics cards maybe they'll skip them with rdna3 and do it with rdna5 that's sort of what um 
has been hinted at maybe maybe it's going to happen but yeah i guess we won't won't find out for a little while nothing concrete anyway i guess as uh both amd and nvidia's next gen gpus likely won't be hitting the market until the fourth quarter of next year or maybe even early early 2025 if recent related uh sort of rumors are true there is also related speculation that amd might do an rdna3 refresh with 3d vcash gpus though i won't get too much into this as it is a bit more speculation and there's also even more speculation that an RDA, rdna 3.5 architecture is in the works though it does seem that might only be for ryzen 8000 integrated graphics so apus for like uh, laptops and uh, other mobile like handhelds and things but yeah if any any more news comes out about this i'll definitely uh definitely cover it it's uh yeah always big news when uh there's shifts in sort of the gpu uh gpu markets and the things are related to it but yeah if you want more info definitely go check that more's always dead video out it's um yeah be be good if you want uh just a bit more info and now the next bit of amd gpu news so asrock has submitted its upcoming rx 7800 xt and 7700 xt graphics cards to the regulatory office of the eurasian economic commission so this is another sort of confirmation i guess of the soon to be announced 7800 xt and 7700 xt had covers the, these cards in a previous tech news video and it is looking like amd and the aibs adding sort of board partners like a like um asrock and uh, sapphire they are ready in for the launch which will likely take place in early september at this point with a possible announcement at the end of august i think maybe even at gamescom in germany which runs from the 23rd to the 27th of august or around that sort of time they amd could do their own um announcement but yeah it's looking like end of august announcement and sort of sometime in early or middle of september for release but yeah this new information was sent to the eec so eurasian economic commission by asrock and it details the 7700 xt and 77 uh, 7800 and 7700 XT as having 16 gigabyte and 12 gigabyte of VRAM respectively. Um, these VRAM mounts, yeah, they were to be expected given the market segment and where they sit in comparison to the 7900 XT, which is 20 gigabytes of VRAM and the XTX, which is 24 gigabytes of VRAM. So the predecessors of these upcoming cards from ASRock, the RX 6800 XT and 6700 XT, along with all AIBs for these cards and the reference cards had the same like respective 16 gigabytes and 12 gigabytes VRAM amounts. And it looks like these cards will likely compete with the, with yet yeah, Nvidia's RTX 4070 Ti and 4070 GPUs. And the RX 7800 XT will be slightly slower, uh, by the sounds of things than the recently released rx 7900 gre while the 7700 xt will probably be a fair bit faster than the next amd gpu down the stack the rx 7600 but yeah given the gaps in amd's lineups i also suspect we could see an rx 7700 a non-xt with 10 gigabytes or 12 gigabytes of vram at some point in the future but as far as I can tell, there's no info on whether this, this card may come to fruition. You may also see like the 7600 XT and 7500 XT, things like that. But um, there's no, no, I uh, don't even think there's any rumors or anything on any of those cards um, as of yet. But yeah, if any more AMD related stuff, because <laughs> there's so much of it recently, uh, may, yeah, if any more comes up, I'll definitely cover that. And that's, yeah, that's basically the AMD stuff done. We're on to NVIDIA news next. So yeah, more uh, more GPU news, but yeah, NVIDIA this time. So NVIDIA has now introduced three new workstation GPUs to its current lineup. These are the RTX 5000, RTX A4500, and the RTX 4000 workstation GPUs. We'll start with the higher end one, the RTX 5000. This GPU has at its core the ADA or ADA AD102. GPU which features 12,800 CUDA cores and 32 gigabytes of ECC error correction code VRAM and will cost around $4,000. So actually this isn't the highest tier I had a look of workstation cards that NVIDIA has. NVIDIA already has a flagship workstation GPU, I believe it's the flagship one. 
So this is the RTX 6000, which has 8,176 CUDA cores and 48 gigabytes of ECC VRAM and costs uh, about $6,800, so quite a bit. But um, yeah, the next up of these new GPUs is the RTX A4500. This has an AD104 GPU at its core and features 7,680 CUDA cores with 24 gigabytes of ECC VRAM and will cost about $2,250. Finally, the RTX 4000 which have an AD104 GPU at its core as well and feature uh, 6,144 CUDA cores with 20 gigabytes of EEC VRAM. Um, looks like it will cost $1,250. The, actually, the RTX 4000 will also come with a uh, small form factor variant, which looks like it will cost the same amount. But um, yeah, just thought I'd cover these. These are workstation GPUs targeted at, at sort of like AI and LLM, so large language models, I believe, and data science and professional 3D rendering and things along those lines. But uh, there are videos actually of workstation GPUs being used for gaming, though they generally perform less favorably than their sort of GeForce counterparts in gaming workloads at the sort of same, certainly at the same price. But um, yeah, the same sort of um, a performance tier, I guess, um, or CUDA core count and things. Though they do actually benefit from their sort of larger VRAM pools, but um, definitely probably not worth it to get one if you're just just gaming. <laughs> you may as well just go with the GeForce, the RTX, the regular RTX cards. But yeah, if I see one of these cards being tested in a YouTube video, I might include it in a future YouTube spotlight section because yeah, it's quite interesting just seeing these cards being used for uh, gaming workloads and things. <laughs> it can be quite interesting to watch. Sometimes in the past, I think Linus has. Tech Tips, uh, Linus has text, uh, tested, um, tested like workstation GPUs for gaming, and it's yeah, it's quite, it can be some quite interesting results actually. But yeah, so if any of those come up, I'll probably include them in a future spotlight section. Now, on some Intel news so another week and another sort of round of upcoming Intel CPU leagues. This time, benchmarks for the i9 14900K and i7 14700K have surfaced, so these. CPUs which are in Intel sort of upcoming 14th gen Raptor like refresh uh, uh, processors. Yeah, they're looking like they were releasing in early to mid October. The flagship i9 4900K, I think it's basically been confirmed, will have 24 cores and 32 threads with 8 P cores and 16 E cores. On the sort of next to down, the i7 14700K will likely have 20 cores and 28 threads with 8P cores again, but with 12 E cores. And uh, yeah, going by these new benchmarks, um, the 14th gen i9 will be around 14% faster overall than the 14th gen i7. If we uh, go and break the scores down, the i9 was 15% faster in productivity, 12% faster in creativity. And 20% faster in responsiveness. Not quite sure how they decide on all that, but um, but those were the sort of metrics given. So I thought I'd uh, speak, cover them here. But I will say you might want to take these results with a pinch of salt, as the scores achieved were actually lower than these uh, CPU's 13th gen counterparts. This is likely because these 14th gen processors are either engineering samples or qualification samples. And sort of not the not the final revision of the silicon, so yeah, you would you would hope there would be a boost when they're fully released, but um yeah, these results give a still give a good co comparison within the sort of fourteenth gen of of differences between the upcoming i nine and i seven CPUs, as these upcoming CPUs are a refresh and not a whole architecture though it is probable we will see a performance boost, but yeah, just not a huge one, but at least a performance boost you'd hope. And it actually looks like Intel is likely to announce the 14th gen CPUs at its Intel Innovation 2023 event, which is running from the 19th until the 20th of September, I believe. So yeah, definitely check that out. I'll likely cover it. It's going to be fairly big news, I'd imagine, a new Intel CPU generation. So yeah, I'll definitely cover that on the 19th and 20th or whichever videos are out there that week. So that's the sort of 
i9 and i7 14th gen benchmark news covered there's a quick bit of more intel news uh cpu news next it looks like intel is going to reach a budget or you may say sort of ultra budget given expect cpu this potential processor will be a dual core cpu with hyperthreading with the name of the or the going by the name intel 300 it will feature two cores as mentioned with four threads six megabytes of l3 cache and a 46 watt tdp power draw the two cores will be p cores and it will have no e cores by the looks this uh yeah intel 300 uh, is named to cpu will be the successor to the intel pentium gold lineup specifically i believe the pentium gold g7400 it also looks like this cpu will be announced during intel's innovation 2023 about i'm kind of surprised that intel still do dual core cpus but i guess there is a market for sort of budget office or media pcs that need little in the way of uh, sort of performance so they're good for that but yeah there's no information regarding how much these may cost but the pentium gold g7400 which this is looking to replace or looks like it will replace costs around 60 dollars so I would expect it to be priced at 60 to 70 maybe a bit more than that uh, upon release. Maybe if um, anyone sort of tests this for gaming, I would, uh, yeah, maybe do a bit of a spotlight on it or, yeah, just um, chat about uh, reviews on it. Maybe see what uh, see what happens when it, when, if, it, when it, if it does release. So I do like seeing how sort of budget, um, budget tiered or sort of lower end stuff uh sort of performs it's always quite interesting to me just to see see what um see what sort of performance the that lower tier gets in uh in gaming but also i guess production stuff although i couldn't imagine a dual core even a new one would do too well in production and stuff it might be okay for certain gaming tasks but uh yeah maybe if there's any videos on it we'll we'll cover that or videos or reviews i guess so yeah that's that bit done now we move into a couple bits of Valve and Steam Deck news. Firstly, Valve has started uh, selling refurbished Steam Decks with prices around a hundred ish dollars lower than their sort of factory new uh, counterparts. From what Valve has said, these refurbished Steam Decks will be quote thoroughly tested to the same high standards as our retail units. Yeah, I guess I'm sort of kind of surprised I didn't I uh, hadn't really thought of a. Uh, valve doing this but it's pretty cool actually but uh, yeah valve is selling these refurbished steam decks for the following prices in the following three configurations the base 64 gig storage model is 319 dollars or about 279 pounds the 250 gig a byte storage model is 419 dollars or 369 pounds and finally the 512 gigabyte storage model is five hundred and nineteen dollars or about four hundred and sixty pounds valve also said that quote all refurbished units meet or even exceed the performance standards of new retail units although they may have minor cosmetic blemishes they provide a reliable high quality gaming experience at a lower cost end quote i yeah don't have and have not used a steam deck but i do like the idea of a mini handheld pc i've thought one uh, looking into them for a few couple of years but yeah i might sort of get one at some point but i don't usually game on the go if i did buy one it would yeah it would probably just be used at home <laughs> i couldn't imagine or maybe maybe i would take it away and if i ever do anything but um generally i just have it as like sort of just a handheld uh thing at home <laughs> which it's kind of what i'm not unsure about getting one really but yeah if i was to buy one it probably would be the next iteration of the steam deck um which hopefully would have a fair boost in hardware and performance, but there's not really any details on that. There's a few rumblings that Valve, well, I think Valve are working on one, but it, or at least the very early sort of blueprints for one, but um, yeah, nothing, nothing concrete yet as far as I know. So yeah, I mean, yeah, these um, refurbished Steam Decks actually seem like a good buy to me if you're, if you're in the market for one or a handheld sort of PC or mini PC in general. As yeah, you save the money on a product that should work exactly the same as a new unit, um, and uh, should perform like one. And uh, yeah, so uh, just wanted to mention as well, it does come with the standard uh, Steam Deck warranty of twelve months from from what Valve have said at least. But um, yeah, go check one of these out. Check uh, 
I had a look on Steam and they are they some of them were in stock, so uh I think the two higher tier models when I checked were in stock. So yeah, if you're interested in getting a Steam Deck, maybe maybe get a refurbished one and send it saving like a hundred or so dollars or pounds is um yeah, the way to go if you want one. And the next bit of Steam Deck news is that someone has modded one of the handhelds with thirty two gigabytes of RAM. So the Steam Deck comes with a uh, non-configurable uh, RAM, which is limited to 16 gigabytes. There have been a number of other physical modifications made to the Steam Deck by the sort of modern community, including increased SSD storage and uh, display changes, actually. Uh, there was a video of someone installing a 1200p display, I believe, in one, which is, uh, yeah, quite interesting. So this new mod by the X or Twitter user, uh, Balaz Triska, I'm not sure I pronounced that right, but um, yeah, shows the user's Steam Deck with an upgraded system memory of 32 gigabytes. This user does seem to have a history of modding the device. And yeah, it's quite impressive, actually. The task to get this done looks like it's very complicated, as you might expect, given the, the De Steam Deck only has a 16 gigabyte RAM option. But yeah, this I guess this could increase performance in gaming or production workloads if you wanted to use the Steam Deck for production that could be quite interesting maybe quite an interesting video i might have to check if there are videos on people sort of doing that with the steam deck um but yeah that would have much or, or any uplift going by these screenshots provided though it does seem to have worked though we we'll have to wait for benchmark to see if it has made an impact on performance so yeah it's quite interesting uh modern modern devices i'm always interested in that sort of thing watching videos on it on youtube of all sorts of devices so yeah now people are doing it more more in depth with the Steam Deck, so that's that's really cool. That's the Steam Deck sort of news covered. So next we've got some retro console related news. So the company 8-Bit Do, who sell all sorts of sort of retro and retro inspired products, are releasing an adapter which will allow you to use modern consoles with the PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2. When I saw this news, yeah, I thought I had to add it as yeah, it's really cool to me. Quite uh, interesting, this sort of retro tech stuff. I believe when I checked 8 bit, though, offer other adapters for other consoles, but this is specifically for the PS1 and PS2 consoles. But yeah, definitely check their site if, um, if uh, you are interested in other consoles that have, have uh, adapters that they've made. I'll be linking their site in the description or specifically the page to this adapter. But yeah, you can just browse the site and see what other things they have. It's quite an interesting site. The adapter is compatible with both consoles as their controller ports are um, are identical, the PS1 and PS2 from what I read. The adapter enables Bluetooth connectivity for wireless gaming on these two uh, retro consoles, but also comes with a USB-C port and cable. So that you can use a wired connection to charge and play as, as it said on their website. Uh, it looks like this new adapter will work with Sony, Microsoft and Nintendo controllers from sort of the last couple generations of, of uh, sort of modern consoles, including the DualSense, I think that's the DualSense it's the 5, maybe the PS5 controller, I think. DualShock 4, Xbox Series, uh, sort of the Xbox controllers that you can use for Windows and stuff. Xbox One controller uh the wii u pro and switch pro controllers as well actually so that's interesting but yeah definitely check uh 8-bit do site for compatibility i'll yeah link it in the description as i said one thing to note the article that i actually read says that some ps2 games rely on the ps2 pressure sensitive face buttons for so sort of gameplay functions and uh most modern controllers apparently lack this feature so uh so yeah consider that before you buy one um Especially if like the games you want to play on PS2 are uh, are games that sort of require that functionality. Maybe I'm not really sure. You'd have to check though your specific sort of game use case for that one. So yeah, Eight Bit do sell the receiver sort of slash adapter for twenty five or twenty four nine nine twenty five dollars directly from their site or from Amazon US currently. Although I checked the Amazon US page, it was unavailable. Um, and there isn't from what I saw in Amazon UK or any of her Amazon, it was just Amazon US or through their, their main site, which I guess their main site delivers globally. But yeah, I might actually buy this um, from 8-Bit Do at some point. Uh, I like the idea of using my sort of modern Xbox uh, controller with an old console, because obviously use it with my Xbox and my PC. 
but um, yeah, it would be cool to use one with an old console. Seems a uh, yeah, especially useful if you've got like damaged or faulty controllers or have lost the originals or decided to like buy a PS1 or PS2 secondhand without the controller. I see quite a lot of people selling uh, older consoles without controllers because um, they've lost them or something. But yeah, so seems like a pretty awesome product to me. I'll um, I'll definitely cover more products they do in the future if they uh, if they release any more stuff. But yeah, sort of uh, out of the blue a bit. I'm quite yeah, sort of pleasantly surprised. I guess it's really cool, really cool piece of uh, little tech hardware from uh, from Eight Bit Do. Next up, I will be covering the Backblaze quarterly hard drive disc stats. Just for some uh, some context, Backblaze is one of the I believe one of the largest sort of cloud storage companies uh, and it releases a quarterly assessment of how the hard drives it has in use are faring from a sort of a failure standpoint but i have seen the stuff or seen it uh, referenced in the past but never actually looked into it until until now but going by these latest quarterly results it looks like backblaze had tested just below sort of 241,000 hard drives that are in use with the data group sort of depending on the manufacturer and the results gained going by the results backblaze uh has released in this latest quarterly uh stat statistics the afr or annual failure rate for this quarter was 2.28 percent which is a considerable increase from the previous quarter's afr of 1.54 percent at least according to the article i read but yeah it does seem like a fairly sizable increase it does seem like the increase in annual failure rates is mainly due to an increased failure rate among 8 and 10 terabyte uh, hard drives. The manufacturers that Backblaze uses are HGST, which I think was formerly a subsidiary of Hitachi, um, but is now owned by Western Digital, from what I could, the info I could find. And then we got Seagate, Toshiba, and... Uh, WDC, which is Western Digital, Western Digital Corporation, I believe. But yeah, given this uh, information, I guess some people might be concerned. But Andy from Andy Klein from Backblaze said, "Quote: Are we worried about the increase in dry failure rates? Of course, we'd like to see them lower, but the inescapable reality of the cloud storage business is that drives fail." Over the years, we have seen a wide range of failure rates across different manufacturers drive models and drive sizes if you're not prepared prepare for that you will fail end quote yeah i do find this information from backblaze fairly interesting as i'm looking at getting a new hard drive purely for backup so i'm glad and sort of appreciate that they provide this information it is um it's nice to have for uh just i think all consumers and enterprise users everyone really if you're um into uh sort of data backup and storage and things so yeah, it is a nice bit of info to have. So next up, again this week, some sort of more heavy science-related news. This time an update on the nuclear fusion front. In December last year, there was a breakthrough in the nuclear fusion space. The experiment was, there was an experiment and it was the first, I believe, to record a net gain from a fusion reaction. As far as I know, all the tests and sort of experiments um, up until this or that point in December had consumed more energy than they had output, if I'm correct. Or maybe I've got that wrong. <laughs> but um, yeah, this this output uh, was relatively small, at least when compared to what we would need to, to be sort of economically viable. But yeah, now the same laboratory that conducted the first net gain test has announced that they have replicated the experiment. This experiment was conducted by the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory last month and had created a larger energy yield than the December experiment. But yeah, I think this is generally great news as fusion energy is another sort of holy grail of science, more more than, yeah, more specifically, I guess, like energy science, but it, science as a whole. Though we are still likely at least a few decades from large scale sort of economic nuclear fusion that would be used to power sort of the planet. It is still a great achievement. That should hopefully pave the way for uh, larger experiments and breakthroughs in the field. And if all goes well, we could see nuclear fusion-based power plants coming online in, I guess, two or three decades, or, or actually, <laughs> given the next little bit, potentially sooner. There is a Washington-based startup called Helion Energy, which is working on creating a fusion power plant in less than a decade. 
and has impressed Microsoft enough that they have ended up to a binding agreement with Helion Energy. That's Microsoft invented the agreement with Helion Energy. But yeah, that might seem optimistic, but if they are correct, then we may have a fusion-powered sort of world, I guess, uh, sooner than most expect, which is quite interesting. If there is uh, or are any more updates on the fusion front from the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, National Laboratory, or Helion Energy, or any other company or sort of individual, then yeah, you can expect me to cover it here. So yeah, I am quite interested in that side of science. And that is the main news topics sort of covered. I'll just cover a couple bits now. It's nothing nothing major, just some sort of updates really. But um, yeah, nothing, nothing really new on the new and upcoming tech front other than the stuff I've sort of already discussed. Um, and sort of tech deals wise, not too much to speak of. I'm considering sort of um, maybe, maybe sunsetting the upcoming tech and tech deal sections um, as I generally cover any sort of upcoming new and upcoming tech in the main topics and um, uh, the tech deal section I think maybe could have their own sort of video but yeah I may may replace both these with like standalone shorter videos for sort of major announcements related to upcoming tech and if I notice any good tech deals or price drops I could do a separate current deals video potentially I will add that I've had a bit of a idea on the sort of tech deals front. So if you're in the UK and follow tech, you likely know of CX or Sex. They're a secondhand retailer who sells all sorts of things, among them sort of PC hardware and games, old consoles, etc. but also some new stuff. And uh, they are like predominantly based in the UK, but have stores across Europe, including quite a few in Spain and Portugal and Places forever feel actually when I looked like uh, which I was a bit surprised about. I thought they were just UK and uh, sort of um, had bits dotted around Europe, but um, but yeah, they have stores apparently in India, Mexico, and even Australia. There are none in the US as far as I can tell, but um, yeah, I've used them to buy a number of things, mostly older games, but also PC and console hardware. So yeah, I may may do videos in the future on sort of tech and hardware finds at CX, or if I think there are sort of good deals there maybe so that might be a might be a separate video at some point as yeah i might remove the tech deal sort of section from the from the news news videos and yeah spin them off into their sort of um own standalone standalone videos maybe where yeah i maybe go over the sort of gpu and cpu pricing updates things like that or any um any sort of deals or price drops i notice really throughout through anywhere anywhere online and retailers and things and just general sort of maybe pricing trends in the sort of pc hardware market but yeah we'll have to see that will likely be in the future so yeah that's the main part of the video done i will do the video spotlight quick youtube video spotlight before we sort of wrap up this so yeah the video spotlight for this week is a gamer's nexus video and it's the power spec power spec pre-built so Gamers Nexus is in the video reviews the Micro Center, which are uh, Power Spec Micro ATX pre built. So I believe Power Spec are like a in house, uh, they're owned by Micro Center, I'm pretty sure. So they do like their own sort of in house budget uh, PCs for them, Power Spec do. So yeah, it could be quite an interesting watch from uh, Gamers Nexus. They review all sorts of uh, PC builds and pre builds and stuff from companies to sort of review how, how good or generally bad they are or can be. Depends. Um, some of them are right, but I think recently a lot of them have been pretty poor. But yeah, I'll link the video in the description. Go go check that out. And that's all the tech coverage from me today. If you're interested, you can also check out my gaming news, which was published yesterday or should have been published yesterday. And as always, feedback is appreciated. So go ahead and like or dislike and leave a comment if you enjoyed my videos and commentary. Uh, feel free to subscribe. Thank you for watching and I'll be back again soon.